let us know when we are visible. I can see you guys. You can. Oh, wonderful. Awesome. Okay, well, we're excited to be here and welcome. It's a it's another fun topic for us. I think it's one of Stephanie's favorite topics. Is, Absolutely. Is aperture. I'm here with bells on today. So, welcome. Uh, we are capturing True Emotion, your most trusted source for finding a certified professional photographer. Uh, I'm Stephanie Adriana, and I'm Val Westover. <laughs> we got married a year and a half ago, and uh, so now we are the Westovers. We've been saying we've been married a year and a half now for like half a year. Now. Yeah, it's a year and a half. Okay, okay. Keep going. Okay, so we are certified professional photographers. We have 7,000 active clients, which is cool, a little stressful at times, but awesome problem. Uh, Val's portrait photographers, we do wedding, headshots, events, which are just crazy. They're going off right now. And I do boudoir, which Val is not allowed to do. Go figure. We also do one-on-one -on -one photography coaching, which is fantastic. And uh, right now, currently, our participants, our coaching students, are coming with us on our East Meets West Montana Photography Expedition. We, we still have, um, I think, two spots left. We do. If so, anyone's interested, just um, we'll, we'll tell you more about it towards the end. Absolutely. All right, so Val is the author of a book, and because he wrote a book about photography, we then went around to 25 cities in the U.S. and Canada and taught over 23,000 people in person photography. So it was quite a fun time. So we're going to be discussing Aperture from our online course. Um, one of the segments from our online course, um, the full course is called Understanding the Basic Elements of Photography. And Oh, and so yeah, in, in our free time, all that extra free time that we have, we also do fine art. So we're in our first gallery in Laguna Beach, so we're so excited at the Forest and Ocean Gallery. You know, I'm, so. glad, I'm glad this is here because, you know, when it comes to aperture, um, first of all, this image was taken in February. We were in Ireland, and it was the deep fog. And I want you could barely see the tree in the in the background. Had I tried to blur the background, the tree would have just been so difficult to bring back in post production. So I had to have a longer depth of field, which we'll talk about. Yeah. And uh, this is an aperture picture too. But this uh, so this course is from or the aperture that we're going to discuss today. Uh, this segment of our course is from Understanding the Basic Elements of Photography, our online course, which at the end we will tell you how to get. Um, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, just don't <laughs> copy and sell our stuff. Um, this image right here is, um, for those of you who already know what f-stops are, this was f2.8, I believe. Yes. Oh, no, 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 it was f4. Oh, are you sure? That, so that was a 400. 2.8 lens. Oh, that's right. Yeah. So okay, we rented nice. that there in Austin, Texas. Okay. Yep. And Val uh, was not in the cage. Oh, wait. Go back, Val. Go back to that picture. All right. So the cool thing about your aperture oh, yeah. is, and the cool thing about this picture, is this picture, Val, luckily and fortunately, was on the other side of the fence. So he is shooting this picture through a chain link fence. So when you use your aperture correctly, you can do magical things with it, like make chain link fences disappear. So yeah, so, so had I not used the aperture and, and the technique of zooming in, which we'll, we'll go over that with you, you would see a chain link fence between me and the lion's here. Yep, we did not erase it in Photoshop. It is still there. It's just made visible by using a large aperture. So we'll discuss that. Invisible. In, oh, invisible, sorry. Keep going. And there's Montana. So aperture, controlling light and depth of field. So a lot of people don't realize that the very first thing for your aperture is aperture controls light. So most people get confused 
more people get confused by aperture than they do shutter speed. And there's a couple of reasons for that, and that's because of uh, numbers and uh, lens uh, opening sizes. So we'll discuss that. Well, another thing, too, is back in the old days, you would change your aperture. You had to change your aperture um, with a ring on the lens, where right. today you don't. Know, everything is changed with um, a dial on your camera. It's digital. So that some people actually think the aperture is in the camera for some, somehow. It's not. So actually, aperture is not in your camera, but your aperture is located in your lens. There is a diaphragm inside of your lens that can get larger or smaller. They call this diaphragm your aperture. The aperture is an adjustable circular opening, a diaphragm, that controls the amount of light coming in through the lens, and that is its first purpose of aperture is to control light. When your lens has a large aperture, a large opening, a lot of light can pass through it. That's kind of common sense. And when you use a small aperture, only a little bit of light can pass through it. So we're going to talk about the times when you will be needing a large, medium, or small aperture for your lighting conditions. Absolutely. The main function of your aperture is to gather light and to control the amount of light coming in through the lens. And before you even move the page, this is what I feel is so important to tell people. Is so many people think that your aperture, the main purpose of it is to create the crazy, neat, magical effects. But when, in fact, the reason why you pay big bucks for your uh, large opening lenses, like 2.8 and so on, the reason why you pay so much money for those lenses is because you can use them in low light situations. Okay, so what is aperture? So lenses gather light, and apertures can restrict the volume of light that is gathered, which gives you control of the amount of light that reaches your image sensor. So back in the old days, I used film, and there was times where I didn't have much light, so I had to use a large aperture to gather as much light as possible to be able to strike the film. Today we use image sensors, same concept. So the aperture is very much like the pupil in your eye. If you don't know how to control your aperture, just take a peek, especially in the mirror, at what your own eyes are doing or what somebody else's eyes do when they're in bright or dark light. When you go into the bright light, your pupils get small. They get constricted. And so, you know, when you're outside in the bright sunshine, and a lot of the time that's why you have to wear sunglasses. When you go into low light, your pupils get really large, kind of like owl-like looking eyes. So it's kind of neat for you to experiment. So with maybe that. maybe in the future we'll all have aperture eyes. Only if it wasn't bright outside. Yes. Yeah. I wonder if the Terminator has aperture eyes. I'm sure it would be neat if we could control it. So. So now the f-stop refers to the size of the aperture. A, a lot of people get confused with the F number. And so, but, but if you look, the physical size, when, when somebody refers to aperture, a large or small aperture, they're talking about, we're talking about the physical size. Is it large or small? We're not talking about the F number. Because if you look at the F number, the F number is small when the physical size is large. So do we explain it here, or do we, do we have it on another screen? So, yep, when we refer to the size, so just, this is a hard concept for some people to get. When we refer to the size of the aperture, we're not referring to the F number. We are just <laughs> referring to the physical size of the well, aperture. Well, there's a real easy way for people to understand. I think I put it in here. And so the F number is just the measuring unit. So the smaller the F-stop numbers, for instance, F4, the larger the aperture. And then the larger the F-stop number, F32, the smaller the aperture. So if we take a look right here, f-stops are in fact the low dominator. Denominator. <laughs> oh, you're right. Denominator. <laughs> what did I say? It's a fraction, babe. Didn't I say that? It's, it, it's close. Okay. Keep going. <laughs> okay. Anyways, um, okay, so look, take a look at an inch. An mm -hmm. inch. Okay, look. Here's an inch. Why is your inch so big? I think the guy thing. 
Would you stop? Okay. Look at. Take a look at an inch. If you look at an inch, an inch is one, right? As Correct. the inch gets smaller, the fraction on the on the end of the one gets larger. You get so, the lower denominator. Yeah. So one over two, one over two, um, one over four. So the number is getting smaller. Smaller. No, larger. But the inch is getting smaller. I guess so. See, this is where the confusion comes, but just take a look at it so you can see that F4 is a large opening and F32, so 1 over 32 is a small opening. Okay, so typically the larger the aperture, the more expensive the lens. Correct. They, they call this a fast lens. They call this a fast lens because more light can pass through it, allowing you to have faster shutter speeds. I, I run into people all the time. I'm in a gymnasium. I can't get crisp, sharp shots of my child playing basketball. And the reason why is because their shutter speed's not fast enough. They need a larger aperture. Um, in some cases, a more expensive lens. Correct. But so, we do have a, a tip for a not so expensive lens, don't we? Yeah, we do. Okay, so uh, most people have some sort of zoom lens. Um, if you bought a kit, if you went to any place and you bought a camera as a kit, most likely you have a what they call an f3.5 to f5.6 lens. So if you look on the top of your lens, you'll see those numbers, f3.5 to f5.6. And so what, that, what does that mean? That means that when you're not zoomed in, then your aperture has the ability to open all the way up to f3.5, which is a large opening. Wait a minute, why does it look small here? Uh, well, hey, you found okay. a goof on your own uh, Yeah, own that f3.5 is bigger than bigger. f4. <laughs> I don't know what's going on here, sorry. But that graphic is just a wee bit off. It needs to be a bigger opening than f4. Okay, so anyways, However, once you start zooming in on this lens, then it no longer has the ability to have an aperture of f3.5. Once you're all the way zoomed in, now this particular lens can only have an aperture of f5.6. And so for a lot of you, your lens is not broken when that happens. It's just the restriction of your lens. So if you see that it says, 3.5 to 5.6, it means that when you zoom, you no longer can go to a large 3.5 aperture. Yeah, so um, the advantage is these lenses are much more affordable and they're a lot lighter. The disadvantage is the inability to have large apertures at times when you still need to zoom in. Aha! There it is. There's that big. A little bit bigger. <laughs> okay. So, there you go. I'm a little slow on pushing these buttons, I guess. Yeah, push more buttons. Yeah. Okay, so um, how do we measure light? So, what is a stop of light? We've discussed this um, in some of our other webinars. And so when... It's the same with shutter speed also. Yeah, so when we talk about one full stop of light, it's a measurement of light. So, we... We can't measure distance by saying from here to there, so we measure distance with inches, feet, and miles. So we can't measure light by saying I, I need more or less light. We need to know specifically how much light. So we talk in measurements, a stop of light. So one full stop of light, what you're looking at below is, is kind of looking like at a ruler. What one full F stop of light would be next to another full F stop of light. So F4 is one stop of light larger than f5.6. So as you go smaller and smaller, these are one full stops of light smaller and smaller all the way to f32. All right, so we had this in our uh, shutter speed webinar a couple weeks ago. So if you remember this graph, it is exactly the same thing. Aperture does the same thing that shutter speed does when you move one stop of light more or one stop of light less as you do the same thing with shutter speed. So when you change your aperture by one full stop of light larger from 5.6 to 
or yeah, F 5.6 to F4, you have just doubled the amount of light coming in through your lens. When you go in the opposite direction, you are now taking in half as much light. So what's so important about this is really that it is a truly large difference in the amount of light that you're doing. So anytime you change that F stop by one full stop, you will half or double the amount of light that comes through your lens, depending on whether you make the aperture smaller or larger. Wow, I pushed the buttons at the right time on there that one. Go. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's kind of the, the technical boring stuff about aperture. Now we get it to go into my favorite part of aperture, and that's the magical part of aperture. And yeah, I guess, you know, I don't find that boring because you're a, I, I like technical stuff. Yeah, and, you're that techie guy. Um, but that's how you control light is with f-stops, and you have to know what the f number is on your aperture. Absolutely. So, uh, okay, so we just spent all that little bit of time discussing how aperture controls light. Now let's talk about how it controls the magical effects of depth of field. Here's okay. your moose again. You told so, the moose story last time. Sorry. There's there's times when we're doing landscape. Mm -hmm. We don't want to blur the background. There's times when I'm doing portrait photography where I want to blur the background but not completely. Like, for example, if I'm photographing a family on the beach, I don't want to blur the background so much so that they can't even tell they were at the beach. Correct. That's why they selected that backdrop. But you do want to create a little bit of that blur because to me it looks kind of just like a snapshot if you can see indefinitely into a family portrait. So I do like it when you've got a little bit of that artistic blur. So. Now this image right here, I had to have a shallow depth of field. I wanted to blur the background. And the yeah. reason why is because had I had a long depth of field, the background would have been in focus, and now this moose would have just been blended into the background. Yeah, because moose are very uh, camouflaged kind of animals. But as you can see, because Val used such a large aperture that the moose's nose, because their faces are so long, his nose is already starting to get a little bit blurry. And then if you look at the shoulder on his back, that's blurry, and the back antler is blurry. So Val is very fortunate that he realized and he focused on the eye, which is always what's important when you're photographing people and animals, is you get that eye to be very sharp and just a little bit of the focus dropped off on the nose and a little bit on the shoulder. It's a magical shot. Now, yes, this can be done in post-production. However, if you can do it straight out of camera, such in this case right here, you're going to end up with a much higher quality image. Because anytime you go and you manipulate your image in post-production to create special effects and filters and so on, you are now um, degrading. degrading the total quality of that image. So a shallow depth of field where you can blur the foreground and the background gives it a 3D effect. Absolutely. So when you focus, there's a small area in front of your subject and behind your subject that will be in focus. They call this an, ex, ex, I think not expectable, acceptable <laughs> area of focus. Oh, I've got another type over there. They call this area your depth of field. You can control this area that will be in focus. When you use a large aperture, you can have a shallow depth of field. And when you use a small, okay, so large aperture, uh, meaning a, uh, a small F number. And when you use a small aperture, tiny opening with a large F number, you can have a longer depth of field. Okay, so here, I'm going to show pictures. So. Thank you. Okay, so depth of field can be increased or decreased depending on the size of the aperture. So um, there's people that can go out there with their cameras and they can take a shot of a flower, they zoom in, and now the background's blurry and they don't know what they did. They're not sure how to duplicate that again later. And it's very simple. It's a very simple, easy process. So we're going to go into how to blur the background every single time. But here's your depth of field. Here's a little little graphic that'll kind of explain. So when light passes through your lens, when it 
passes through the, the opening of the lens. That light is crisscrossing at the point of focus. So right where you're focusing, let's say that, that area right there, that's where the light starts to crisscross. And this area is um, where your depth of field be, um, is, is pretty much established. So with a, so these thin lines right here represent the area that you're focusing. So let's say that's your subject, whether it's a person, a tree, a flower, or whatever. And so the area that crisscrosses with a large opening of f2.8, for instance, I don't know why all these arrows should pop up here. Here, let me do this. Okay, so f2.8. So with f2.8, that's a large opening. And in fact, some of you listening might not have a lens that opens to f2.8, but that's okay. If you have a lens that opens to f3.5, it's the same, not quite the same thing, but it's, that's considered a large opening as well. So as you can see, the light is um, crisscrossing through a larger opening so the depth of field is going to be more shallow than F32 where that light passes through a pinhole to the center, the focal point. The focal point. So it really stretches that depth of field, that area. So this area in gold or yellow, whatever it looks like to you on your end, that's the area that you're, is your focus. And normally, there is a larger area behind your subject than there is in front. But I did it this way. Just Absolutely. There you okay. go. There's our long depth of field. All right. So when you use a large aperture, if you want a shallow depth of field, this image was taken with a large aperture of f4. And by using a large aperture, the hands are in focus and the background is blurry, causing a shallow depth of field. So there's, you know, a lot of people will look at an image like this and think, okay, what did you do in post-production? This is straight out of camera. There's no retouching. There's no special anything. It's straight out of camera. And it's a couple dancing on the dance floor, the bride and the groom. And I had to use a large aperture. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you can actually see me in, in the ring. In, in the ring, in the groom's ring right there. <laughs> and you're not that close, but you're still... I'm on the dance floor. I was using, okay, the lens I was using was a... I think it was my um, 28 to 70 millimeter. Uh -huh. 28 to 70 millimeter lens. And so I had to come in kind of close because that's not a, a zoom lens. That's, yeah. Well, it's a zoom lens, but it's not a um, your telephoto. And for those of you who uh, aren't shooting weddings but would like to shoot weddings, just know, go in and grab that shot and get the heck off the dance floor. That's true. <laughs> Otherwise, you'll end up in their dance video. And that's no good. So, yeah, there you go. So, now to accomplish a shot like this where you are blurring the background, let me, let me first also explain about distance to subject. Because uh, when you're taking a picture, oh, 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 okay. Okay, so everybody hold their their finger in front of your face. Yeah, we're going to do an experiment here. So let's all assume that our, the aperture in our eye right now is f4. And because we're in a room or outside or wherever we might be, the lighting is going to be the same regardless where our finger is. So let's say that the aperture in our eye is f4. So now I'm holding my finger right here real close to my eye. To your nose, almost. Yeah, and it's... Very blurry. Okay, it's blurry. No, no, my finger's in focus, but the background's blurry. Mm -hmm. So now, as I pull my finger farther and farther away from me, the background is becoming clearer and clearer and clearer, even though the aperture in my eye is still the same. The aperture in my eye is still F4. Right. Assuming. So this is really important to know because a lot of people get confused. I'm using a large aperture, so... How come my picture's not blurred? Well, the reason why is because you're too far away from, uh, or your, your subject is too close to the background, for instance. Correct, or you are too far away from your subject. 
So that's, that's the thing we get all of the time. We're out photographing and on expeditions with photographers, and they're saying, oh my gosh, I'm using a large aperture, but why is that palm tree that is uh, 200 feet away still in focus? Why is the background still in focus behind that palm tree? And the reason why is because you are too far away from that palm tree. So t for me to get this shot right here, I was using my 28 to 70 millimeter lens. So I zoomed in all the way to 70 millimeter, which was still not close enough, so I now had to get on the dance floor and still come in close to right. grab the shot. So it was a combination of a large aperture and zooming in. And getting close to the subject. Okay. So, yeah. and, and another thing to consider too, if you're taking a picture of a flower, and you want to blur the other flowers behind the front flower. Just recognize the farther away the other flowers are in the background, the more blurry they will become. Correct. So I, I get that so much too. I have so many people that when they go out with us to go on expeditions, they're standing right on top of the flower and they expect the ground to be blurry. And that's the thing, is that that can't happen. So uh, the, uh, you have to actually get on your tummy and let the uh, other flowers be further away from the flower you're photographing in order for them to be blurry. Okay, so in this instance here, both of these images were taken with a, an aperture of f4. I wanted to blur the background, so the image on the left, we all know I used an aperture of f4. I zoomed in and I got close. Well, Stephanie was photographing this party here. So what did she do? She needed a large aperture because she was in a low light situation. So she needed to open up that aperture so that she would have enough light. But she didn't want to blur the background. So she didn't zoom in. She went a little wider with her lens and she backed up and dis distanced herself away from the subject. So just keep in mind, you can blur the background and still have longer depths of fill by distance to subject. So, photographer who, no, it was Stephanie who took this job. We already know that. Okay, so this image right here, the most, I used an aperture of f4, and same thing here by getting in really close to the moose <laughs> and focusing on his eye, I was able to blur the background, cause a 3D effect. Now, I think I, uh, for for those who joined us la uh, two weeks ago, I think I, I think I talked about the moose. Um, don't get close to a moose because they will try to hurt you. I I I was actually protected by a bunch of trees. So. Yeah, that's what Bell thinks being protected is is behind a few trees. You're lucky you didn't become a human pinata. I, I, but anyways, okay. So I'm alive today. So so what? Okay. So this image, look at that. Here's proof, that, Kevin, you've you got to be impressed. This is proof that um, Stephanie um, made it to the top of Half Dome. <laughs> yeah, I did hike up there. So this <laughs> image, this image uh, that's my son on the right, my uh, little Irish boy. But anyways, and Stephanie, you had dark hair here. Yeah, I did. Okay, With so I wanted an image. I didn't want to blur the background. I wanted an, an image that had long dips of fill just to really showcase um, the beautiful mountains and the beautiful landscape that we were seeing from the top of Half Dome. So I used an aperture of f16, which is a smaller aperture. And what did I do? I didn't zoom in. I went a little bit more wide angle and distanced myself from Stephanie and my boy and was able to get longer depth of fill. Awesome. Yeah, we love those Ansel Adams pictures. Yeah, and uh, you do have to make sure somebody's got your back there when you're on top of Half Dome and not backing up off the cliff. Thank you. That's true. <laughs> okay, so here's um, um, some examples right here. This little, little chart. Do you remember me taking these pictures? Yeah, we set that up in the house. In, no, in Montana? Yep. Okay, so anyways, I had to get... I, how did I stand those up? We did it... Oh my gosh, don't, don't admit that. We had all wine corks 
<laughs> holding this card that oh that's oh my gosh you're right a little science project there yeah keep going okay so anyways <laughs> the this is actually a fun project if you it it doesn't have to be playing cards being held up by wine corks it could be a fence it could be a line of trees it could be um, bottles, toys. it can be toys, Barbies, it can be cars, little toy cars, dinosaurs, whatever you want to line up. And this is really fun to do, actually. So as you can see here, Aperture F4, which is a large opening. Um, now I'm focusing on the queen of diamonds. So you can see it. the ace, what is that, ace of diamonds on the left is so blurry you can't even tell. That spades? That looks like a diamond to me. Oh yeah, sorry. Isn't that red thing a diamond? Yes, you're right. Keep going. Okay. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay. So, anyways, let's take a look at the difference between a large opening and the small opening. So, a large opening, the camera didn't move, and the only setting that I was changing on my camera was the aperture. So, I was just adjusting the aperture and I was getting a much longer depth of field with an aperture of f22 than I was with the aperture f4. So it all depends on the effect that you're trying to achieve. As a, as a photographer, we, are, we, we have a creative vision of what we want to achieve when we're pushing the button. We don't want to just snap a button. I call those people um, cell phone picture takers. So with this in mind, you can create the depth of field that you want straight out of camera. Okay, so we know that aperture gathers light and controls the amount of light coming through the lens. You can open it up to allow more light in or close it down to reduce the amount of light that comes in. So a small F number indicates a large aperture. That's, and that's going to give you more light. It's going to allow more light to come through. And then a large F number, F22 for example, indicates a small opening, a small aperture. So a small aperture is going to allow less light. Sometimes we're out on a bright sunny day and there's just so much light we have to really restrict the amount of light coming through the lens. So use a large aperture in low light situations. So if you're in the house, if you are photographing a reception, if you're in a gymnasium, if the sun is starting to go down, um, the sun's already set, you're still trying to shoot your kid's soccer pictures, you need a large aperture. So use a small aperture when you have too much light, of course, and use a large aperture when you want that shallow depth of field. So when you want to blur the background, the foreground and or the background, use a large aperture, but remember to zoom in and get in close. And of course, when you want that beautiful landscape where you have infinite focus, just like Ansel Adams, then you would use a small aperture, which of course is a large F number. All right. So here's some practice to do with your aperture because this is fun. So here we go. This is just to make sure that you guys were listening. So aperture controls mainly light and then the magical super effects of depth of field. Okay, so now this image, I took this one, didn't I? Yes, you did. I'll okay, give thanks. you credit for that. All right, so this was a project, a magazine cover project, um, and it was to represent summer. When we started photographing these popsicles, they were just in a bucket with ice, and if you just take a snapshot, that's kind of boring, so what we wanted to do is just create a, a, a creative, um, fun effect. Yep. With, with popsicles and color and by using a large aperture. And I believe the aperture was f2.8. Correct. I think so. so you want to use a large aperture to make the background in your picture out of focus. Fun things you can do with this. Now remember when I took this picture. You didn't. It, sorry. That was me. You took this one? Yeah. It's a wedding in San Francisco. Thank you. Oh wait a minute. I wasn't even there. <laughs> no you weren't. Okay. I took this one. Yes, you did. Okay, good. Aperture works very much the same as the human eye does, the way your uh, pupils dilate and uh, uh, constrict. 
So now this was a shallow depth of field. You can see because the clothing on the, the baby is out of focus, the ear is out of focus. Um, however, the drool is not out of focus. <laughs> All right. Okay. Would you use a smaller or larger aperture in what condition? So for bright light, if you want to limit the amount of light that's coming in through your lens, uh, you could use a small aperture. In the nighttime or in the dark, you would want to use a large aperture. And by the way, there is no flash that I used to get that shot. It's just a natural light. For portrait photography, you want to use a large aperture. Well, typically a larger. It doesn't have to be your largest, but in portrait photography, you want to draw your eyes to the person's face. One of the best ways to do that is to either slightly or, or, or even more to blur the background. Correct. And for landscape photography, when you're waxing Ansel Adams and you want that incredible infinite depth of field, you want to use your small aperture, which remember, is a large F number. So, Kevin, this was still on top of Half Dome. That's the view that you get, one of the views that you get to see. It's just breathtaking. So by using a small aperture, you're able to showcase and have infinite focus. Absolutely. So a higher number indicates a smaller aperture. And this was on one of our expeditions in Montana. I, I, I can't remember what the aperture was here, but I mean, to me, the trees in the background still look a little blurry. So I have a feeling that you were maybe at f8 or so, or you're probably still using a larger aperture and probably a real fast shutter speed. Yep, absolutely. A higher number indicates a smaller aperture, and a small aperture allows less light to come in. So if you, uh, Kevin, if you hear tap tap dancing going on right now. Um, my mother-in-law just got here with her beautiful dog, and we have wooden floors, and her dog, Brandy, is excited to see. <laughs> there we go. So use a small aperture to make your subject and background in focus. Okay, so each full f-stop lets in half as much light as the full setting before it, and double the light of the full setting after it. So here's, here's how to practice. Find a willing subject and practice photographing that subject or with all of your apertures, <laughs> with all your aperture settings. It's probably better to line up dominoes or um, maybe cups. Well, or, you could have a very quiet little doggy who will cooperate with you. That would work. Yeah. Or you could actually line up beer balls. No, no. We don't condone that. Okay. To keep your photography very easy while having more control of your exposure, here are three things to keep in mind about your aperture. You want to use... I like your tooth house. Yes, sweetheart. Fine. Sorry. You want to use that large ap aperture when you need more light or when you're trying to achieve a shallow depth of field. And remember, like I said, the first thing you're using your aperture for is for the light. Use a small aperture to restrict the light when you are trying to achieve a long depth of field. This is extremely repetitive. Oh, sorry. ISO determines the sensitivity of your image sensor. An aperture determines how much light strikes that image sensor. So with that said, um, here's how we suggest to um, people to practice if they just want to wrap their head around aperture. It's okay to go outside of manual mode, you know, at times, especially if you want to wrap your head around one of the elements. So an aperture priority, your camera is going to be in charge of shutter speed for you. So that will give you the ability to be in charge of your ISO and your aperture. So some people think that just because they're an aperture priority that they're only in charge of aperture which is untrue. You're still responsible for, wait a minute, who's laughing at us? <laughs> hey, yeah, we're a Ashley, that's not funny. Okay, anyways, in aperture priority, your camera is going to be in charge of shutter speed. Now, if you only changed your aperture and you ignored the ISO, then you're going to find yourself at times over or underexposing your image because 
your image sensor might be too sensitive or not sensitive enough to light. So make sure that you go in and you study the basics of photography so that you have a strong understanding of why and when to change your ISO. So here's, I'm going to put it in a nutshell. So here's how to practice when you're in aperture priority. For, um, going to A or AV. A is for, A, actually AV is for Canon. Everyone else is A. So that represents aperture priority mode. So I, I always recommend to, to people to go outside where it's bright and select a low ISO number, such as 100 or 200. And the reason why is because when it's bright, that low ISO 100 or 200 is going to give your image sensor the ability of not being very sensitive to light. So it means it can handle more light. So next, we're going to want to blur the background with a shallow depth of field. So to do that, you're going to select an aperture of f5.6. Now, if you can go larger than f5.6 when you're zoomed in, by all means do it. But most people um, that have a uh, camera kit, most of their lenses, once they zoom in, that aperture will only be able to open up as large as f5.6. So let's just say f5.6 right now. So to blur the background, you're going to need to zoom in and get in really close. So go outside, use an aperture of f5.6. The beauty about aperture priority is once you set your aperture to f5.6, it's going to stay there. It's not going to move until you select another aperture setting. So you don't have to keep your finger on the button the whole time in fear that you're going to lose that setting. So by having an aperture of f5.6 and zooming in, you'll be able to grab the shot. Now keep in mind, you're here at the bottom, it says remember to keep an eye on your shutter speed. Even though the camera is in charge of your shutter speed, you still want to keep an eye on it. Because remember, if your shutter speed is too slow, you're going, to blur the, you're going to blur the whole picture. So if your shutter speed is too slow, all you have to do is raise your ISO, and that will force the camera's shutter speed to, to, to be faster. Now, if you get in too close to your subject, your camera will most probably won't be able to focus. I get a lot of people who say that too when we're on expedition. Uh-oh, my camera is broken. Why won't it take the shot? And that is because you need to step away from the subject. So basically, if your camera will not take the shot, it means that you are zoomed in and you are too close to your subject. So take a half a step or a step away and see if now your uh, camera will be able to uh, not only focus but take the shot. And it's all about getting out there and getting to know your lenses and um, the limitations and what it can and can't do. Absolutely. So uh, now when you switch it up and you have a longer depth of field, it's really, really easy. So you use a smaller aperture, remember, larger number. You go a little wider and now every so, and I, I mean wider as is you do not zoom in. You do wide angle and now everything will be in focus with a much longer depth of field. By selecting a smaller aperture of f16 and smaller, you'll be restricting the amount of light greatly from striking your camera's image sensor. So just remember that when you're shooting an aperture priority, even though your camera is in charge of your shutter speed, you need to keep an eye on it because if your shutter speed is too slow, you need to raise your ISO. And here's another thing. When you're using these small size apertures, you're restricting the amount of light coming in through your lens. So you are going to have to use higher ISOs. But if you want to get a very high quality image and you want that long depth of field, you sometimes are going to have to go with a very slow shutter speed. Ansel Adams did. So when you do that, you need to know that your camera needs to be on a tripod. Because remember, if your shutter speed is below 60 or 1 60th, 1 over 60 of a second, 
That means your shutter, your camera is too slow to hand hold, so you need to use a tripod. Just a tip. There you go. Okay. So just as a reminder, by raising your ISO higher and higher, your image sensor will become more and more sensitive to light, forcing your camera's shutter to go faster and faster, making sure that the image sensor doesn't get too much light. So once your shutter speed is fast enough, then you can start shooting again. So here's, here's a tip that we like to give about the lens. So for sharp, non-blurry pictures, make sure that your camera is using a shutter speed of 1 60th of a second or faster when you're hand holding your camera. And if your shutter speed is too slow, then raise your ISO. Right, and what we mean by blurry is we mean that if your subject's hair is flowing in the wind or your friend is waving at you, it means that their hand or their hair and your subject will be in focus. But remember, if you're trying to cause that blurry background, that will be blurry, just like you want, especially if you're zoomed in using a large aperture. Okay, that's a cool picture. It is, it would be nice if it wasn't dark. By understanding and controlling aperture, you'll have more control of light and the special effects of depth of field. Now go out and spend as much time as you can shooting an aperture priority until you feel you have a strong understanding about what is happening when you use smaller or larger apertures. Remember, all you have to do in aperture priority is select your desired aperture and keep an eye on the shutter speed. Remember to do that. And if your shutter speed is too slow, just raise your ISO. Okay, so here's a little bonus, and in this bonus right here, um, we're going to talk about um, some people have a whole bunch of lenses in their camera bag, and that's because they bought a kit, and they don't know why they have so many lenses, or when should they use this lens versus this lens here. So basically, it's all in how you want to compose your image. So, like for, for example, each of these squares, these colored squares, represents um, a particular millimeter size lens. So the entire image encompassed in a white border represents 18 millimeter. White shot wide angle. Not yeah. zoomed in. So I was in Yellowstone. Mm -hmm. This is Yellowstone. And I didn't want to, actually I had to get kind of close to the map. And these, oh, are, no, these, are, elk, these so. are elk, yes because I was using an 18 millimeter. And uh, no, this is not a good idea. Again, do not get close to elk. <laughs> Absolutely not. Unless you have an exit plan and you have somebody there in a vehicle that you can dive into real fast. But anyways, the entire image was shot at 18 millimeter. And the reason why is because I wanted a wide angle shot. I wanted to showcase the whole valley with the river running through it and the elk and the landscape and the clouds. So here's the entire image. Now had I used or wanted a different effect, then I could have used a different lens or zoom in to 24 millimeter. Correct. So this is 24 millimeter right here. Here's 35 millimeter. As you change your millimeters, of course you're getting in closer to your subject, but look what's also happening. You're not only getting closer, but you're squeezing in the sides, the top, uh, the tops and the sides. Top, bottom, and side, I should say. So 55 millimeter, 70 millimeter, 85, and so on. 105, boy it's getting blurry. Yeah. And then 200 millimeter. Absolutely, so it just depends on what it is you're looking for when you're composing your shot as to which lens you want to use. You know, are you wanting that uh, uh, big, deep, wide angle of gorgeous landscape shot, or are you trying to get pictures of those gorgeous animals that you're photographing? So it just depends on what your uh, goal, your end goal is for the shot. That's awesome. I think um, we covered it. Absolutely. So one tip before we tell everybody how to get the online course for okay. me. So just something, and the reason why Aperture is one of my favorite uh, 
uh, elements of photography. Not only because with your aperture you can get all that beautiful, wonderful light, especially in low light situations. And so for wedding photographers, baby photographers, we know that we just love those uh, large apertures so we can shoot in natural light. Uh, but the other thing also is that shallow depth of field. One bonus of using a large aperture out in the bright sunlight is that you not only can zoom in and get close with that blurry background, but you get incredibly fast shutter speeds. When you're using a large aperture outside, that's when I feel that that magic happens. So are you going to be doing that <clears throat> to Ashley? <laughs> yes, I will be using a large aperture, and we just found out that one of our participants who has come with us on a couple of our expeditions to Montana is actually listening to this webinar. She just texted us. So she is going to be coming, and she's going to be one of our uh, models this time around with her husband, and uh, we'll be photographing them to get some beautiful pictures of them. And uh, so, yes, I will be using a very large aperture in that bright sunlight, getting gorgeous, gorgeous pictures of the both of them out there in Montana. So, so yeah, so that's one of the beautiful perks for using a large aperture is that you get that super fast shutter speed and you can use a low ISO at the same time creating mind-blowing high quality images. So this is how you get the discounted online course. You're going to want to go to www.capturingtrueemotion.com. You're going to select the online photography course if you liked it and you're going to use the coupon code love my camera, all lowercase, for a 75% discount. But if you want to get the online course for free, you're going to go to www.capturingtrueemotion.com forward slash beta forward slash photographer dash coupon. And you're going to use your coupon code that you get from collages, uh, all uppercase collages1 for a free lifetime listing on our uh, uh, photography listing site, and you'll get the online course. But this goes only to qualified registered photographers, so as long as you meet our qualifications and our requirements, and uh, we love to have you on our site, so please, please uh, register with us. Okay, hold on. So we dedicate ourselves to giving you the knowledge, skill, and the tools to unlock your creativity and to achieve your photography goals. So if you're interested in getting coached by us, please contact us. We love our students and we love you so much that we get to go on fun expeditions and we'll see you there, Ashley. Yes, we love you. We've, so. got, we've got a couple of fun things coming up. We've got um, Salt Lake City. Yes, we're going to do a photography workshop in Salt Lake City, Exposure and Light Success. We're going to do that in San Juan Capistrano as well. And then we are also going to Orlando, Florida, and we will be doing that same course in Lou Gardens at an expedition there. So, so if you want to find out more about that, um, either email us or visit our website. And um, you can find well, most of our events if you go to valwestoverphotography.com on the top menu, go to events, and then from there you can see um, some of our events that we have. And if you're interested in joining us in Montana, we have two spots left. Um, I highly recommend it. Yes. Yeah. an experience of a lifetime. If you want to know more about it, just um, um, either call or email us. And not only that, but even though that there are tons of horses there and tons of gorgeous vistas and beautiful things, cowboys, cowgirls, our, our beautiful friend Ashley and her husband who will be our cowboy, cowgirl model so for this Ash trip. Ashley's listening to us right now. Yeah. I bet you she's dying that she can't talk. <laughs> but anyway, uh, even though we have all of that there, and you might say, hey, uh, I'm really not a horse person and uh, the wilderness is a little bit much for me. We talk about all the professional aspects of photography and taking your photography to the next level. If you do want to improve your photography, this is just a trip and experience of a lifetime. So even if horses aren't your thing. We can't thank you enough for joining us again. Um, sometimes 
this is very basic for some of you out there and for for those of you who are um, trying to wrap the basic elements of photography around your head sometimes it can be a little complicated so please reach out to us we're here to help um, here's our phone number here's our email address and our website so thank you thank you Kevin for having us oh my god thank you collages we love collages oh, of course thank thank you for presenting again with another great topic um, <clears throat> So I'm going to take the screen sharing back over to myself. Take it away. All right. So that does conclude the webinar. Um, if you guys have any questions, uh, Val and Stephanie's contact information was back on that slide. Hopefully you grabbed it. If, not, if you do need it, um, you can always reach out to us. You can reach me at webinar at collages.net. Um, and once again, the coupon code, if you are interested in, um, in signing up for capturing True Motion, um, that link is right there. We'll also be sending out um, an email that has a direct link to this, as well as a recording of the webinar, just in case you, uh, just in case you missed anything. Um, you, know, you can go back, watch the webinar again on our YouTube channel, and uh, you know, pause it and watch it at your own pace. Uh, which is also really helpful if you're, you know, if you're trying to go back and maybe pick up on one of the techniques that Val and Stephanie use. Um, and like, you know, like Val and Stephanie said, for some of you out there, this may be kind of a refresher on 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 things you already know about your photography, um, which is always good to refresh. Maybe maybe you pick up a new technique during their presentation, which is always a plus. Um, it's always great to find new ways to make things a little bit better. Val and Stephanie are very good at explaining how to make all of that happen. And um, let's see. So we are going to be sending out a few more emails uh, in the next, probably for September, about a few more webinars. So keep an eye out for those um, if you're interested. And um, Val and Stephanie, we're getting a lot of good feedback. A lot of people are saying, I don't know if you can see the um, the question or the in, in the chat field, but a lot of people are coming in saying thank you again for your, another great webinar. But um, just wanted to pass that on to you guys. Oh, I see that. Thank you. No, you guys wow. are awesome. Um, I don't have any questions that I wasn't able to answer right now. Um, <laughs> yeah, but I think you guys did a good. I think mean, you guys did a great job on explaining everything. Yeah, aperture so, is an easy but fun one. Um, so unless you guys have anything to say, I was just going to wrap it up and close this down so everyone can get back to their, their day. No, I just got a text from Ashley, and um, she says that she's going to bring whiskey bottles to Montana for me. Uh, aperture practice. For act. <laughs> for <Nice>. act. <laughs> so That'll hopefully provide some good photos. Yeah, absolutely, and it'll be blurry for other reasons instead of our aperture. Hey, thank you guys so much. Oh, my gosh. No problem. Thanks again, guys, for another great webinar. Um, and thanks to everyone out there for attending. Um, stay tuned for the next webinar, and uh, we'll be sending it out via email very shortly. So have a good day. Don, Stephanie, thank you again. Okay, we'll see you next time. You awesome. Sounds thank good. you, everybody. Bye, guys. Bye.